How many brought your Bibles to the house of the Lord? All right, get them out, fire them up. I want to begin uh, today in Exodus, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the bush, midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. How many has ever heard this story before? Maybe even heard it in Sunday school. And just so happens by coincidence that we are starting a brand new program in the house of the Lord, and it's called Sunday School. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's a new concept. Uh, first Sunday in February, and just out of curiosity, I want to see the hands of anyone that has taught in Sunday school over the years. Let me see your hands. Now everybody look around and see that. If you've taught in, all these that have taught in Sunday school over the years. Now, uh, we had our first Sunday school uh, teacher training this morning, and Sister Amber is our Sunday school director. She's doing a fantastic job. Let's give her a hand. We have our preliminary slate of uh, teachers that are on board and we are excited to have these involved, but we're not done yet recruiting teachers for the Sunday school department. So you looked around and you saw the hands of those who have taught over the years in Sunday school. And so if they can do it, you can do it too. And we ask you to pray and seek the Lord if perhaps He's got a spot for you in our Sunday school department. But we're excited about this. And this is where our little ones, beginning at the very earliest ages, are fed and exposed the Word of God. They, they uh, get to be, interact with it on a regular basis. Of course, uh, we would already expect that that's happening in your homes, those of you that have little ones. But... Uh, Sunday school has always held a special place in the house of the Lord, and God can do great things through Sunday school. Amen? Amen. So you've heard this story before, how God begins to call unto Moses and uh, begins to convey to Moses that he has heard the cry, the affliction of his people, and he's preparing to lead them out of bondage. And not only is he going to lead them out of bondage, he's going to use Moses to do it. And so, skipping down, we want to uh, go down to the fourth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Moses answered and said, But behold, thy, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. The Lord said unto him, What is in thy hand? And he said, A rod. That's not a rod, it's a rod. <laughs> he said, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground, it became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand, take it by the tail. He put forth his hand and caught it. It became a, a rod in his hand again. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. The Lord said, furthermore, Put now thy hand into thy bosom. He put his hand into his bosom. When he lay it out, he took it out. Behold, his hand was leprous as snow. He said, Put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his, hand, his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not 
believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. It shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since. Thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And I preached a sermon, oh, some years back on that verse right there, that uh, there was no greater prophet that the Lord ever raised up to speak unto his children than the prophet Moses, save Jesus Christ himself. And at no place in the biblical record do we ever see that God healed Moses of his speech impediment. Whether it was a stutter or whatever it was, he never healed him of that. And yet, he still continued to use him exactly the way that he was because it was not based on Moses' eloquence. It was based on the power and the authority of the Word of God. And even as uh, Brother Garrett uh, preached last week, talking about Paul saying in more than one place, he told the Corinthians, was it the Philippians, the Thess Thessalonians, that uh, Brother Garrett preached on last week, that he did not come, the eloquence of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power of God. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or blind, have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him who thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now imagine, imagine if you will, that you were in Moses' shoes and you just heard the voice of God, you saw the burning bush, you came up to the mountain of God, you heard God speaking through the angel out of the burning bush, it says. You saw the signs that God performed in your very body uh, with the rod, with the leprosy, uh, uh, the promise of taking water and turning it into blood. And you saw these things with your own eyes and you could declare that God was everything that he said that he would be. He's everything that he said that he already was. You would have no doubt in your mind that God was God. He goes on to say, well, who, who uh, uh, should I say is sending me to the children of Israel? He, he said, tell them that I am is sending you. And that's what the sacred name of God, Yahweh, literally translated means. I am. I am that I am. The self-existent one. And so Moses saw with his own eyes that day on the holy mount all that God was and all that he could do. And this was just a small sample. And there was no doubt in Moses' mind that God was who he said he was. So how is it that God ended up being angry at Moses. Anybody remember? Raise your hand and see if you can remember what we've heard in this house that faith is. Don't blur it out, just raise your hand. We know the scripture that says in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Furthermore, in verse 6, for without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But what have we heard in this house what faith is? I walked into our pastor's house and there above the uh, uh, dining room there to walk out onto their de uh, deck. Sister Christy, what does that say that you printed up there? Amen. Everybody has at one time or another heard that saying 
in the master's house. That faith is a right attitude towards God and a right attitude towards yourself. So you cannot tell me this day that Moses was in the very presence of God, saw what God could do, heard the voice of God. You cannot tell me or convince me that Moses did not have a right attitude towards God. So what was so displeasing in God's sight that God actually got angry at the one he was calling to be his prophet and his spokesman and it said upon his death that Israel has never had a prophet like the prophet Moses. Save Jesus Christ himself. Church, it was because he didn't have a right attitude towards himself. You can have all the faith in God and you cannot tell me today that this people does not have faith in God. I could go right down the row and point to every single one of you and, and be able to declare with a true testimony and witness that you've got faith in God. There is no doubt in your mind of who God says that He is. He actually is what He says He can do. He will actually be able to do. And there is not any fault in your faith in God today. But what if I came and told you that that's not all that faith was? That faith is a right attitude towards God and it is a right attitude towards yourself and you can have the one part and have it perfect in God's sight and yet we can fall short in the second part and God's hand cannot move in our life. He said, but the Bible talks about all we have to do is have a right attitude towards God and have faith in God, but that's not all the faith is. We must have a right attitude towards ourselves. And the part God put up with Moses through all of these 13 verses in chapter 4 of coming up with excuse after excuse and God answered the excuse and he answered the excuse and he provided a solution until Moses finally said it doesn't matter what you say God go ahead and choose somebody else Moses was disqualifying himself from the promise and that's what got God angry didn't get him angry that he raised questions didn't get him angry that he might even be struggling with some doubt as the man that came to Jesus and said Lord I believe help thou my unbelief Jesus didn't chastise him for that that he was struggling in his faith but when he chastised Moses it was his, his attitude towards himself that it doesn't matter, God, all that I've just witnessed with my own eyes. I can't believe that you would use someone like me. Now, this is the man that grew up in Pharaoh's household. Miraculous series of events. Was slated for the uh, execution. Was placed in the back basket, floated down the river. It's amazing that the crocodiles didn't get him about two seconds after he was placed in the water. You know the story. I don't have to recount it to you. They're getting ready to show it on TV. Easter, Pastor, Passover season's coming up. You can watch it yourself. Uh, Charlton Heston. <laughs> and the uh, Ten Commandments. This case. Raised in Pharaoh's household, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, had the best, highest education could possibly be. And if you'll read in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen's recounting all this, uh, one of the seven deacons, he uh, even says that Moses was told, probably by his mother and father, because he, even though he was raised in Pharaoh's household, he was, he was nursed uh, by his mother, miraculous series of events, and somehow he came into the knowledge that God would use him to be a deliverer for his people. Even 40 years before he shows up on Mount Sinai. Go back and read it yourself, Acts chapter 7. But what happened is he took matters into his own hand. And now he's in trouble with Pharaoh and he ends up on the backside of the desert. And what happens in that 40 years time? 
I've made a mistake. Maybe these things I was uh, telling myself and uh, maybe it wasn't true. And I tried to step into what I thought uh, I, I should be doing and it didn't work out. Now I'm on the backside of the desert and he's put all that behind him. And he said, that really was not for me. And now when his time actually comes and God himself shows up on the scene and God himself is calling him out by name and telling him all the ways that he's going to use them, he can't get past this image that he has of himself that he's a mess up, he's somehow no good, that it doesn't matter what happened in the past, uh, where he was raised and what advantages that he had, now he's got this image that that was not for me. So much time has passed that uh, maybe those promises weren't true. Uh, he can believe God. He can give witness that God is, is all that he says that he is and all that he's come to do, but he is excluding himself from the promise. And this is not the first time that this has happened. You know the story of Abraham in uh, Genesis 15. Back up a few uh, uh, chapters after these things. The word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And the Lord, uh, Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Thou hast given me no seed, and lo, uh, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look toward, now toward the heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And so Abraham, it was counted to him for righteousness, not that he believed just the promise of what God can do, but what God could do in him. And that was counted unto him for righteousness. And where the problem came is the very next verse in chapter 16 said, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had a handmaid and uh, an Egyptian and whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, uh, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing children. I pray thee going in unto my handmaid. And it, may it be that I obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And so where all the problem came that we're still uh, experiencing in the Middle East today is that Sarai, in her mind, she could believe that someone else, her husband, could be used of God. God could do great and miraculous things through her husband. But she couldn't believe that God would do it through her. And she excluded herself from this promise and took matters into her own hands. And Abraham said, well, uh, I know what God's promise is for me and I believe it. If you can't believe, then let's get this show on the road. And we're still having problems because of that. And God had to then show up again through the angels and, and call Abraham out and said, it's going to be through Sarah, not through anybody else. And Sarah had excluded in her mind so much that when she heard the promise was not just to Abraham, but to her as well, she laughed because she was in the tent she overheard. And she laughed at the promise of God. And who knows what she was laughing about. Uh, maybe saying, well, maybe when pigs fly, that this thing might come to pass. Can you imagine if God had to send that sign to each and every one of us? Have we said that in our heart? When it comes to the promise applying to us, that we, uh, we believe that God can do great things and that He is who He says He is, but we're excluding ourselves from that promise. And maybe we've said in our heart, uh, well, maybe when pigs fly, that'll come to pass. It's bad enough dodging birds 
Uh, and, and when they relieve themselves mid-flight and it lands on your windshield on your car, can you imagine flying pigs, what that would be like? <laughs> I'm pretty sure our insurance rates would go up. Maybe when pigs fly, but shall I have pleasure, she said, after my body is, is old and dead? And wasted, and there was no chance back then, and surely there's not a chance now. And she excluded herself from the, prom from the promise of God, and God had to rebuke her right then and there. Just like God rebuked Moses, and his anger was kindled against Sarah, just like he was kindled against Moses. And see, what my concern is today is that God's anger would be kindled against me. Not that I don't believe in the God and the promises of God, but I don't believe that God could use me. And I would exclude myself from the promises of God and God's anger would be kindled against me. Because you see, we would think in our own mind, oh no, no, I'm going to step back. I'm going to step back. Uh, Lord, there's, there's a whole group of people here that are wonderful and qualified. And uh, uh, man, they're, they're the greatest people on the face of the earth. And I fully well believe that you can use them, any of these here. Uh, but, you know, you don't need me. I'm just going to stand back in the shadows to where you can't see me anymore. Go and send by their hand, Lord. And as God's... Wrath going to get kindled against me because I would do such a thing. See, the thing about Moses, God's wrath was kindled against him, but he didn't let off the hook because the promise was to Moses. God's wrath was kindled against Sarah, had to rebuke her right then and there. He didn't let Sarah off the hook because the promise was to Sarah too. I don't think God's going to let us off the hook in the master's house because the promise is to each and every one of you. It's not just that God d desires to use you. It's not just that he, uh, that's part of his plans. But he doesn't have a backup for your spot. He you said, oh, Brother Dave, are you sure you want to say that? God can be very persuasive, can he? A right attitude towards God, but what's going to get the job done is when we start having a right attitude towards ourselves. Well, Lord, things have happened in my life, and they didn't work out the way that I thought. And when I was younger, I had big plans for myself, and I had big expectations for myself, and I believed that I could do great things in myself, but life just didn't turn out the way that I thought that it would. And so maybe I'm not all that I thought that I would be. God came to someone with a speech impediment. God came to someone with a dead womb. God has always chosen servants and instruments that were not perfect because he wanted to get the glory. It's not about our glory. It's about His glory in us. And church, if we'll only begin to believe, if we'll only begin to change our attitude about ourselves, And he said, well, uh, God persuaded Moses. Does that mean that Moses got the big head? No, it said there was no man more meek on all the face of the earth than the man Moses. It didn't change him. Yeah, having a right attitude towards yourself doesn't mean all of a sudden you have to get prideful. In fact, it's just the opposite. He just simply accepted the premise that God could use him. And then said, Lord, have your way. Here I am. Use me. All church. The promises. The promises that God has given to each and every one of you. Stop pointing to your brother. Stop pointing to your sister and saying, I believe God's going to use them in great and mighty ways, but I'm going to stand back in the shadows and it's for someone else 
And God keeps sending the promises to you. Does he have to show up in a pillar of fire and call your name out specifically before that we'll believe? Moses was 80 years old. I don't know that many of us make it past 80. In fact, even Solomon said, what was it? Uh, three score years and 10. If you make it to four score years, you're really doing something. And Moses was only getting started in God's eyes. It doesn't matter where you are in your life today. God wants to use you if you'll only have a right attitude towards yourself. All the key is, is faith in God. No, that is not the key. Because you've already got faith in God. You can't tell me, you cannot convince me that you are not a people of faith. The key for you being used is to have a right attitude towards yourself. Just believe that the promise is for you and watch how God begins to move in your life. He's going to move in your life for your family. He's going to move in your life at your job. He's going to move in your life and through you for your neighborhood and for this city and for this state and for this nation and for this world. God wants to use you if you'll just have a right attitude towards yourself. Shall we stand? With every head bowed and every eye closed. So begin to reach out unto the Lord. Here I am, God. Use me. Here I am, God. Use me. If you say I'm important to you, Lord, then that makes me important. If you say that your promises are for me as well, then that means your promises are for me. Here I am. Oh, God, use me.